for me. Just a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, we've been trying to do this now for two years, and uh, I, I don't like film because I've seen how it works in school and it's not really effective. So once we had the pandemic, I said, the only way I'll do this lecture is if it's in person. So we'll postpone it for two years now. We finally got permission to do it in person and we can actually talk afterward and see each other. Um, but Wayne McCarthy did a huge, he knows the technology inside and out. Uh, he did a huge amount of work on these pictures. So I always say to Wayne, I'll do any program you want, but I don't want to have anything to do with the technology. I just want to come <laughs> and I can talk about the pictures, but I don't want to put things together. Um, I, I also want to just uh, echo what Wayne said. Uh, my understanding is really good to the uh, people of Waltham. We come down here, my history of Waltham class, we come down here every year. Uh, they give us a, a tour of the building, it's all free. Uh, they've taken us into parts of the house that are close to the public. They take us into the green house. So um, they're a really nice organization and they're, they're really connected to the city of Waltham. They try to be right by the kids of Waltham High School. And I also want to recognize uh, Mary Baker and Janet Crystal from the Waltham Museum. So we have. Uh, uh, if you haven't been to the Waltham Museum down on Lexington Street, you should take a drive down there. Uh, and they have a wonderful collection of World War II artifacts. And I've been talking to them, and they uh, set up a table right here. So afterward, you can take a look at some of the artifacts they have. Uh, some things over here also that are really nice, but they have a lot more things down here you can take a look at too. Okay, so let's get going with the program. Um, the, the image that most Americans have of World War II is national. And I, I was like that for most of my life. You know, when you think of World War II, you think of uh, President Roosevelt, you think of President Truman, you think of General McCarthy, you think of General Eisenhower, you think of battles in the Pacific, you think of the Battle of the Gulf. But, but you don't realize, uh, you know, even today, politically, we're fixated on national solutions and federal solutions, but we don't look at the communities and the huge role that the cities and towns and communities play in making the whole country work. Um, so tonight, the, uh, the story that I want to get across is a story not of what was happening in Asia or Europe or any place like that, but what was happening uh, right here in our community. And you know, they call this generation, greatest generation. And as I, you know, then uh, to really understand what it's so much wide way. I'm sure all of you have members of your family that were in World War II. And uh, kind of the, um, if it was a sports bag, they would be the unsigned heroes of the war. They, uh, they sacrificed and they did a lot of good things for the community and they didn't get a lot of recognition, uh, but, but they quietly helped win the war. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that one was up. Uh, this is a new script going on December 8th. And uh, U.S. declares war in Japan. President says Hawaii attack dastardly. And that's his famous speech, uh, the Day of Infamy speech. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize, uh, the original, his advisors wanted FDI to give this long speech. And FDI went with his gut, and he said, no, a one speech won't work. I want to give a brief speech uh, asking for a declaration of war. And the original line uh, that his advisors came to him, a date which will live in history. And FDI took it, if you go to Hyde Park, if you go to his house, you'll see that he corrected it, and he put in day of infamy. And just you know, the power of words, just changing the word, and how much nicer it sounds, the day of infamy, instead of you know, a day which will live in history. Um, but the interesting thing here, if you look at the far left, we placed Waltham and Newton on war footing. So there was this real fear that we could get attacked. And a uh, committee was formed, the Committee of Public Safety, and their job was to coordinate civil defense. And, you know, we knew we weren't going to be attacked by Japan, but there were German submarines and German ships all over the Atlantic Ocean. And this real fear that Waltham could get attacked with our, with our industry. Okay. So you had to say something about technology, right? <laughs> there we go. 
Okay, uh, Wealthy Federal Bank. I don't know if you remember that, but um, on Main Street, a little past where the Merck is today. And uh, they had a great quote in the paper. It was an advertisement. We are all civilian soldiers. In other words, they're saying that everyone in Wealthy, and now you might not be in the Army, but we're all tied up in what happened. Okay. Okay, the way I divided this, um, I, I, I put down Wealthy and Battle the Axis, I think, but that's not a kind of romantic or whatever. But I want to break it down into uh, chunks, and I want to start with industrial contributions. Okay, this is the Wealthy Federal Bank in the upper left, and that was torn down several years ago. And they had a window, you can see the window if you look at it. And that was open to the public, and they do exhibitions here that exhibit, you know, something amazing for the Girl Scouts or for the church. And this, during World War II, they had all kinds of exhibits uh, encouraging people to help in the war. And the, the slogan is that wealthy industries are doing their part to help the National Defense Program. And this is J.L. Thompson, the, the buckle factory that was down on South Street. And I was looking at this, the, the original picture with the magnifying glass over the weekend. And every exhibit there is about rivets. The importance of rivets in fighting World War II. And all I could think of, because I played this song for my juniors, is Rosie the River. So you, know, you don't think of rivets playing a major role in the war, but that's what Dale Thompson's whole exhibit is on. They've got the largest rivet in the world, the smallest rivet in the world, but they're exhibiting their contribution to the war effort. And of course, Waltham and Watch Company uh, had a tremendous contribution to the war. And this is Waltham Watch in the Federal Bank, America's first watchmaker. Uh, the company is going to boom during uh, World War II. Fred Renee was the, the president. Uh, they were making huge profits in 1944. Fred Renee sold out. Ten years later, the company was in bankruptcy. And a lot of it is due to World War II, which we'll get into in a bit. And this is Wealth and Watch. So this is, the, the owner is Fred Renee. This is his son. His nickname was Spike. I don't remember his real name. That's that's A. Hansen right there, Arthur Hansen. A. Hansen will be the mayor at the beginning of World War II. He'll die of a stroke selling war bonds on the common in 1942. Um, so, Waltham works with victory, and this is about selling uh, war bonds to the workers. So, a banquet of Waltham Watch Company. Look at the watch company inside of it. Rose, uh, during World War II, they had just about 3,000 people working there at Wealthy and Watch. The whole factory was devoted to, um, to the war effort. They were not making civilian watches during the, during the war. And this is an interesting picture here. Wealthy and Watch had, but this is who says. And the Wealthy Museum has right here, when you come up the avenue, you can see the, the blue stars. So, uh, as, as you all know, that. You'd exhibit in a window if you had someone, if you had two people in your family fighting the war, you'd have two blue stars. If you had someone who died in the war, you'd change the blue to a gold star. So you look at pictures at the time. If you look at some of the, um, the, the businesses and factories, you'll see banners with stars, and it's the number of workers from this little division um, who were fighting in World War II. Products of Boston Watch Company. During the war. So these are military watches. This is my dad's watch that I, I, I always wear. Um, and it's, a, it's called a Wealthy Impact watch. These were accurate to within three seconds a day, which was considered incredible. Um, Wealthy stopwatches, we've got chain clocks, an aircraft clock. I think we've got one right over here. We can take a look at it. These are ship chronometers. Right over here. Wealthy compasses. Whenever I uh, hike, I always take my wealthy compass with me, and I'm hoping someone will ask me a direction so I can pull it out. <laughs> and show it. Uh, but if I start telling them about the wealthy watch company, then they just walk away. Okay, wealthy news review. And just, just kind of scan the paper and look at how much it deals with World War II. 
And this is 1943, I believe. General Eisenhower sent a telegram crazy to Walter Bush. Um, he had a great line, if I can, let me see if I can find it. Well, he credited the Waltham Watch Company uh, with playing the mighty North Africa Corps to its needs. So this was um, the battle for North Africa, the German General Rommel, the Desert Fox, and he was driven out and into Sicily. And Eisenhower credited a lot of the Waltham timing devices with helping win the battle in North Africa. So all of them were at Waltham by the Award. And an ear award is meet the excellence. So the army and navy were given an ear award. You had to meet different criteria. And the picture right over here from the news circular. This man here had worked at Wealthy and Watch for 68 years. And I figured it out. He would have been there in the 1870s. The company opened in 1854 well, with a guy named Denison, and then uh, Royal Roberts took over. So he would have been there right from the very side of the company. But between them, they've got people 62 years, 68 years, 55 years, 64 years. A long time to work building watches. Okay. Okay, so they're going to get a new one. So on January 31st, 1945, 2,500 workers together. That's Crescent Street. And you can see the company has got double American flags. And the workers all lined up and they march down Crescent Street. So if you picture this, they go down Crescent, they come down to Moody Street, they take a left, and where do you think they're going? No? Embassy. So here's another look at the look at the line here. And if you look at the, okay, look at this one, look at the cards. You can see the cards are just so. So they're marching down. Go ahead. And this is the embassy here. I don't know what they have to this. You don't have this man up, do you? I would love to know what this is. That would be a great thing to have him in Waltham High School right now. Waltham times the attack. But look at this production for victory only. The problem with that is people still wanted to buy watches. So if, if Elgin is making everything for the war in Hamilton, they're both American companies from Waltham. Where are you going to get a watch? Well, the answer is Switzerland. Switzerland was neutral. So Walter was making huge profits during the war, but the problem is that the Swiss took over the American market. The war came to an end. Walter tried to retool for the watch, for civilian watches, and it, it, um, they, they never got back on track. And in 1954, they, they closed down. And that's a great view of the embassy. Okay, well, that's it. So um, you can see the army here there. They have got the big flag, and every one of the every one of the two thousand five hundred people got a pin to wear that had an E on it, E to excellence. Okay, other companies that got the E award. This is Raytheon, and Raytheon got an E award, um, and they accepted it at poor place. You can see that they don't have a giant. You know, thousands of people lined up, but they've got a handful of people that go up places. Okay. This is a company you don't know, usually think of, uh, WH Nichols. And WH Nichols got five E awards during World War II. They made pumps, different types of heat pumps. Um, 1944, they had 834 employees. Now, WH Nichols was down in the island section of Waltham, if you get out of the Avenue. It's on the left, but you don't usually think of that as having that number of employees. Look at WH Nichols. Companies in there. I, I don't know what they're called now, but that was a local company. Go ahead. And one last picture of this is this is the Waltham Chamber of Commerce. And it's 1944, I believe, and they're having a neat conference of the Wealthy and Chamber of Honors about the war. And if you look over here, they've got different posters up. And I thought how the post is interesting. Once again, I used a magnifying glass. So these are the people who own businesses. Okay, one of the posters, Victory Waits 
when we are late. In other words, get to work on time. And another poster, um, speed up production. So these are the business people who own the businesses and naturally they want to stay on schedule, but they're all about making the workers work more diligently to, to meet what they, what they have to do. And that's at the Hubby Institute. That's um, IBW Hall. Yeah, I was going to say it. Okay, I need more bonds and savings stamps. Everyone was encouraged to buy. What's that? <laughs> oh, uh, everyone was encouraged to buy uh, more bonds and savings stamps. And I just want to. Okay. America sold one hundred and eighty-five billion dollars in. War bonds and savings stamps. They earn 2.9% interest. You'll have to hold them to 10 years to, for maturity. Uh, you bought them at 75% face value. What was the purpose of it? There's a double purpose. The first purpose, of course, raise money for the war. The second purpose is the war started to get going, so did inflation. And the government is thinking if we pull some of that excess money out of the economy with war bonds, it's going to slow down the rate of inflation. And you might recognize this, this is the car barn. This is over on Main Street. But another organization raising money, the Waltham Community War Fund. But all of Waltham is mobilizing. So you know, look at the buses. Help keep America, America. Give double, work, double, give double, the world's in trouble. So the whole community is mobilized behind the war effort. Okay, interesting thing here. I was looking at the background. So this is Maine City Hall would be right over here. And look at the, what, what's happened to styles of dress. Look at the way men dress and women dress. You don't see that too much anymore. <laughs> I'm one of the last of the Mohicans that still is a tie. <laughs> uh, what's the federal bank again? You have to attack by extra war ones. And this is Walton Federal Bank, the place of democracy that you signed dogs. Give up Boys the Edge, sign your bond pledge. Go ahead. Okay, the Boy Scouts help sell bonds. And I don't know who these boys are, but this is a picture taken by um, the news tribune. And they were going to go to us selling war bonds. Okay. This was the big event. So Walter was going to have, they called it a former bond auction. And it was 1943, 7 p.m. And they were going to hold it in Robert Cohen's parking lot. Okay. And this is a news trigger. Walter shooting, look at big event. What a big bottle of man. Walter shooting for Bottle Bowl tonight, a huge war bond auction. Okay, so what Okay. So, um, this is how you gain independence. <laughs> to, to get into Cronin's parking lot, you had to show proof that you had that, that you had signed a pledge to buy the war bond. So you go in and you show that and let you in. If you did it, you had to buy war stamps. You had a, a table set up. You had to buy stamps and you get in. And then they had all kinds of things that were donated. For example, Hathaway Bakery. Anyone remember Hathaway? Okay, good. <laughs> that, that was if you were Babe Ruth, if you were Home Plate, it's a, it looked, the building looks like a wedge. It's right behind Home Plate on Elm Street, across from the French Club. Um, they donated a decorated cake. Uh, Gordon's Liquor donated six bottles of wine. Uh, Publix Market, we had Publix. They donated a few bags of groceries and they donated a ham. And the big rumor in the news tribune was that, believe it or not, there were going to be several pounds of butter available at the auction. So you couldn't get it during World War II. And how would you bid on the, the prizes? Not with money, but the bond, face value of the bonds. So if you had $8,000 in bonds, you could say, I, you know, I'm going to get my total value of that eight thousand dollars. I, I want the halfway cake. You get the halfway cake. So they had a table set up, and they had hundreds of gifts 
provided by local businesses. Okay. So look at the background. So that's the child's room. You can see the lights on the other side. So wealthy federal savings alone. Some of the people live. Okay. There's a child. Do you recognize Crowden Parking Lot here? Is that fence that the park right upon it? If the car was ever neutral, you go right to the river. <laughs> Donations for wealthy people on the auction. Okay. There's the other kids, all the kids here. Go ahead. And you can see the service then, the community in the front, the child's work with the high. They have the wealthy high school in the end, it's up on the stage. Now we get on Moody Street. This is right outside Park Snows. And once again, selling barns. So all of the different stores, the watch company is selling barns. Cronin's advertises that you can buy a barn at any of their service desks. Um, the, the watch company is saying they've got just about every single person working there who's bought barns. So it was almost a competition among the businesses to make sure that everyone was on board buying the war barns. Uh, at Walton High School, in Whole World, they bought uh, stamps. And the stamps, would, I, you could get them for 10 cents or a quarter, and you paste them in a book, and eventually you'd have a $25 book. So, James is one of my students here tonight. James, every day, you would be raising your hand, you'd be saying, Can I buy some more stamps? And I'd say, You give me a buck, and I'll give you a four of them. And you, you paste them in the book, and you, it's a way to save money. Okay, um, walking down is the axis. I don't want to make this about overseas, but I mainly want to focus on women here because they're usually kind of ignored when you look at World War II. Okay? But I had to put one guy in with my dad. <laughs> so my father graduated and gave me the worst year he graduated from Walton High School, 1939. So he graduates with the depression going on. He goes off to BC and Uncle Sam comes calling like all the guys and didn't make any difference if you're in the in college or not. My father always said though, it probably saved his life. He was a business major. So we went into the army instead of being one of the infantry. He was in the army air force. Instead of marching out, he was behind taking care of supplies and stuff like that. So he said it probably saved my life. And they looked and they said, I knew something about business. And I he said, I used to feel so bad for the infantry soldiers marching out into the jungles look, looking for the Japanese. Okay. Okay, take a look here. Way in the background, over the building over there. Uh, that would be the music hall. That's formal wear. They're on the common. And a parade is going to take place here. Uh, BCAs, they're gone now. They were on Lexington Street. And their slogan was Masters of Measurement. I always love that slogan. And put the sign here, Zorta International. I had never heard of it. And one thing technology is good for is you can Google something. Anyone know what Zorta is? It, it's an organization for women's rights. And people in this, women in this, it's an it, executive women with big positions in companies. It's worldwide. The word Zonta is a Native American name, a Sioux name, meaning honesty, honesty and loyalty. So this is BCA's truck going into the parade. The two women right over here. You can defend America. So they're creating women, they're, they're encouraging women to get involved in the war. Okay, who's straight up? Okay, the races. Look at this new building. Building virtually came to a stop in Waltham during the war. Um, you couldn't get supplies, you could not get lumber, you could. Uh, the, the War Production Board, the Federal War Production Board, was controlling the economy. The, virtually no building takes place in Waltham during World War II, with one exception, which I'll show you in a minute. But this is the headline I wanted you to look at. The waves are coming to Waltham, and the waves were women uh, in the Navy. Uh, you had to be between the ages of 20 and 36. You got paid the same as a man. You're not going to be in combat, you'll be in support roles. And this is the ways. I think that's the um, wires building, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But there's a group of waves coming to walk in to recruit. 
And then the other group, the wax. And the wax, it starts out with Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, WAC. Eventually, they shorten that to WAC, the Women's Army Corps. And so you know, they're walking and signing up a woman right here. Yeah. Okay. okay, now look at this. This is wax. This is an embassy here. They've got their booth set up. Go ahead. And that's the embassy. And they have a, they have a ceremony recogni uh, recognizing the women who have signed up for the women's army board. Here they are. Okay, people who fought in the war. Uh, one of the big casualties in the war was Arthur Hanson, May Hanson. And as I said, he was selling war bonds and suffered a massive stroke, and he died on the con. Uh, he was a hero in World War I. His sons fought in World War II. And they had the funeral, as you can see, at the Hubbard Institute. And there goes down the Hanson funeral. This is a great picture. Uh, the RTN building, that was Clarkson Furniture. And look at City Hall, great in, in black. And you can see some of the City Hall workers on the stands here. This is interesting. I don't know if you can make it out. There's a boy down there. You can never see this anymore. But he can ride on a bike filled with newspapers in the basket. And that was an image when we were kids. Let's <laughs> see, you know, kids would deliver newspapers like that. And there's also, you can't see it, well, maybe right there it says Route 128. So Route 128 in Waltham was Lexington Street. So before, before 128 was built, 128 was Lexington Street. You come down 128. There's much of the intersection of Lexington and Maine. You can go out. You're now going on Newton Street. That was 128. That was called Route 128. That's how you get down the Cape, you go through all the different towns. Okay, um, so we've got the Red Cross and civil defense volunteers. And this is interesting. I, I, I know you can't see it. But if you have a deputy asking for a donation to the Red Cross, we are respectfully asking you to send your contributions by your child to his teacher or give them a receipt of the same. We have had 3,000 boys leave the city to fight for us. Surely they should receive our support. Remember, the Red Cross is the only organization overseas which has the access to prison camps. By the help of our Swiss representatives, Red Cross food packages are being carried to war prisoners, even into Japan. And then there's a poem here. The man who wrote it is John Sweet. He lived at 38 Clark Lane in Piety Corner in Waltham. This is what he wrote. Have you forgotten the blood we shed a year ago in Matan's hills? The hopeless fight we carried on that filled your hearts with pride and thrills. Tonight we brought in prison camps for one and hungry as we toss upon our filthy bed of straw. Our only hope is the Red Cross. But God say, don't forget us now. We spent our best that you might live. Search out a grateful hand to us. And so the Red Cross, give, oh give. I thought that was kind of nice. Um, anyone know John Street? Okay, but I thought it was kind of a nice poem. And we're back at the embassy here. Yeah? And the Red Cross, uh, the blood drive. Okay. And this is called the Royal Cross. So the Red Cross, and they do it for a state. He's not really sick people on the floor. Um, and the first day. And if you wanted to sign up for civil defense, these are all the different positions you can apply for. Okay. Okay, this is from the Crohn's. And let me know, remember the other statements? The one that had been, that's from the Crohn's. And the civil defense was in charge of the DRA precautions here. And they would teach, they had people who would come in um, with civil defense and they would train people if we get attacked, this is what you're doing. This is a really interesting map. This was put out by uh, a Washington Committee of Public Safety. 
And it's in case of emergency, where you should go. So where you should you go in Boston? They have three places. Moody Street Fire Station, Lexington Street Fire Station, the Willow Street Fire Station, which I believe opened in 1944. And this picture is 1944. And if you look at the map, <coughs> look at the whole map, they have nothing up here because other than Lakeview, there really wasn't anyone up here. So everyone at Waltham, when you think for a minute, North Junior, North Junior is where government center is. <laughs> think of that being considered North Waltham. <laughs> it's not North Waltham, it's South Waltham, if anything. But that was considered North Waltham because there's nothing about that. And here's the uh, civil defense. This is the auxiliary of the police. And you can see the civil defense. In fact, I see the civil defense um, <laughs> right over here. Welcome to City Hall. This is really nice because one thing. Uh, how many of you know Miss Hannah? You know Miss Hannah? Okay, Miss Hannah was a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, when I was a student at BC, I volunteered over at the uh, Central Dean High School. She was a history teacher. She knew everything about ancient history. Every single wonderful teacher. She lived over on Stern Street in Walton, a uh, member of the Historical Society. She was active in War Place. And when she retired, she had different things. And she said, Why? She said, I know you'll appreciate these. And she gave them to me. But this was one of the war ration books that she said. So sugar was rationed, tires were rationed, gas was rationed, um, it's, uh, wheat was rationed, meat was rationed. It's the only war in American history that we have mandatory rationing. World War One was voluntary. <coughs> it's the ration schemes. Okay, naturally, I had the teachers and students going their part of the war. Okay. I think the paper, I mean, look at how much more news is on the front page than any paper today. Look at the number of stories. And this is just a local paper. But 250 teachers, the outline of the next seven. Um, in, in 1942, the wealthy teachers gave up their spring vacation to work on the rationing program. Uh, kids were dropping out of school to fight in the war. Kids were dropping out of school to go to work because the wages were so high. Industries were trying to recruit kids to, to leave school. <coughs> and this is the wall here, the one in the Federal Savings again. And this class in furniture, this is the common. Two boys here. Wall here students will do it again. They're doing a bond drive and a savings stamp. Yeah. Okay, this is, we went to St. Mary's. Okay, we got one. This is St. Mary's High School. And yeah, take a look here. The, the star, I, just, I took out a magnifying glass to look at the original. There are 300, 322 graduates of St. Mary's who were fighting in World War II. And this is the picture. It's another school picture, of course. I think it's the French school, and I could be wrong, but uh, based on this building here, it looks like a building by the French school, but more wealthy and kids. <coughs> okay. So through the high school. So once again, school is out there for the assembly, and they're raising the blue stock of a number of kids who graduated from South Junior High School. The Boy Scouts, um, the, all kinds of different groups took part in the Waltham Salvage Drive. And they were collecting, they collected newspapers, they collected steel, uh, they collected tin cans. They had directions of what you had to do with the tin can. You had to wash it, you had to take the label off, you had to flatten it out. Uh, trucks would come by collecting all these things. But this Boy Scouts, think the Jets get in the scrap. Group 27. And here's a welcome sound from the Aspen to help. 
Okay, this is what the federal government said to us. We had to collect 90 tons of paper. Some of the math, that was 10 pounds a person. Of, we had a domain in newspaper or books or scrap paper. And they had kids going around picking up cartons. And then this was at least 1943, on November 7th, they were going to have a big collection day. So his kids getting into the salvage drive. Once again, the whole city is mobilized behind the war. Wayne and I were working with this, and you know, I think it's a pretty picture of it. You find the newspapers and stuff there. It looks like Crescent Street. Anyone recognize the building there? Who? It looks like, Marie, does that look like? Yeah, I'm just basing it. It looks like the touring. It just looks like Crescent Street, but I could be wrong. This is a nice picture. This is Con. Over here. This boy has quite a ball. Okay, then Moody Street. So Moody Street has always been a hard walk. And uh, Moody Street was involved in, in the war also. And in my belief, this is today, no Grove of Romans. Look at the sign over there. 51 members of Grove of Romans were in service of their country. And over here, we're proud of the service. The show is our boys and girls are serving for all of us all over the world. By the way, there were 31 Waltham teachers that fought in World War II. Out of the 31, 15 of them were women. That's not, isn't that unusual? So 50, 31 teachers left, 15 were women who were the wax or the waves, and, and then there were guys fighting. This is a great picture. And this is 1943, selling war bonds. I remember Park Snow, and that was another department store. My mother worked there when I was in high school. She got that job. She was in the men's department. And she worked there, I think it was Wednesday and Friday nights. They were open until 9.30, I think, on those two nights. And uh, the Park Snow's was very involved in the war of the two. You can see American flag being displayed down here. Farm and was a shoe school. And this is a parade. This is 1942. It's Flag Day. They had 20,000 people on Moody and Main Street to watch the parade. His park snow is slow. And the park snow is not the store behind here, but a great flow. And if you look carefully, it's the United States. And there's a spider with a swastika on it coming out of America. And over here is a Japanese spider coming from this. Direction encouraging everyone 10% of your money for war bonds. There's our kind of pack souls selling war bonds. Rice birds. Rice birds. And if float, Uncle Sam writing to victory, lets his rice birds underneath it. Oh, don't around. Picture, not really. <laughs> Okay, in front of the embassy, this is the same parade. And if you look carefully here, there's a clock in this hip with a swat sticker right there. That's 1942. Okay, the building of the Moody Street Dam is the only major construction project in the wall field. It was rebuilt in 1943. Before that time, um, it, it almost looked like the Petco Bridge with the arches like that. And it was a rickety bridge made of wood, and Walter rebuilt it in 1943. And you can see the Charles River right here. <laughs> and it's going to grow in the dam like that. So the bridge is going to go like this. It's still a little sex book belt, a 105 club. And there's a Boston Manufacturing Company, uh, Atlantic Register. They sold um, registers. Payroll registers, stuff like that. This old train depot that was knocked down in 1961 for a parking lot. There it is, Moody Street Bridge. Same bridge you see it today, except the railings have been changed. Okay. 
Okay, one of the mistakes I think we made, um, you know, you look at World War II and you just think, okay, everyone, that, that's all people are thinking of, but life goes on. So right now, you know, you read the newspaper and you read, you know, all the political battles in Ukraine, but, you know, the Red Sox are playing tomorrow. Life, life goes on. So here in Walton, Harris Road. So this is down in the Charles River. And my dad used to swim there. My dad grew up at 111 or whatever. And we also had to go to And he took me down there one time. And I, I said, yeah, show me exactly where the beach was. And he you know, said, there's a beach. The float was there. You know, we put it out everything. But look at this here. I would probably be this here. Put it back to me see if it was too cold. Look at this thing. Wouldn't it be great if we had a beach like this in the town now? Okay, I showed this to some of the kids in school who were on the hockey team. I said, I want to show you the Welcome High School hockey team in 1943. I said, you have any comments? And right away they said equipment. Because look at the helmets, look at the equipment. I said, anything else? And they said, why are they outside? <laughs> And I said, because they had to be outside because they didn't have a rink. There was no, they, they, they played at the old rink in, in uh, Boston Arena, but they didn't have to practice there. So you had to wait till the ponds would freeze. And this is uh, over Titan Pond, that's Fox Pond. Uh, some of you might remember, Coach Brent. Uh, Walter Brent. In the history of Boston High School, we were probably the three hockey, in the history of the city, three hockey coaches. This is Brent. History of Boston, it's only been. You know, I coached basketball for a lot of years at the JV level, and other towns, every year they have new coaches coming in. But coaches in Waltham, I mean, it's very stable. Okay, I showed the kids this. I all well recognize Larry Field. And I said, okay, so what's changed? And they said, look at the people. And I said, yeah, before cell phones, before technology, if you wanted to see your friends, you had to go to games, you had to go places. So everything that you had, but all high school football from the 40s. Okay, and then the war winds down, the soldiers return. Okay. And this is who's trigger on the and you see the movie Extra Extra Real on it. The loose trigger runs two editions that day. The nation is on. Now that was June of 1944. In April of 1945, President Roosevelt was again. All walking stores closed. Walking schools closed. Okay. And this is a great newspaper. Uh, I have a lot of people who in Siena gave me to me, and they were all troubled, but I never gave them. And I gave these patients one year to a class where uh, they would get a, they got a current roll, and the old wall would use figure, and they had a computer and said, What's that? And they had to do one, they had a little assignment with this. So at random, I'm handing this out to these patients out. And I had a girl, her name is Nanny Chambers, she gasps, and she says, That's my grandfather. Wow. There he is. And I said, that's your grandfather. She said, he just passed away. So I went down to Wayne. Remember this, Wayne? I went down to Wayne and I said, uh, this is a man his grandfather. He's missing in action. He ended up surviving. And uh, Wayne was in the print shop. He printed a news tribute for her. She gave us the eulogy for the senator. And she gave us something. So we have a historical society, something the eulogy and a couple of other things if I remember right from um, uh, from Mr. Chambers' life. Okay, the journey surrenders. Okay, Rather than getting all that support, I'm going to this. So, dude, it's silent walking in my journey surrender. And you think it would be jubilant walking, but it's, the war's still on. There's no words from Japan, and Japan is going to fight on. This is just me. Well, the Crows took out a full page here. And uh, in the government, of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Well, Crows, it's my time to be planes crashing to the earth. I just thought that was very creative. 
Okay. Yeah, then the war ends. But guys, when uh, it was incredibly expensive to print in color. And the News Tribune, up to 1944, 1945, only had two times when they printed in color. And the, the, no text at all, victory on the here, victory edition. Here's another one. So here's the News Tribune, this is December 7, 1945. 138 Waltham soldiers were killed. 5,215 Waltham soldiers served. And the News Tribune published all the pictures of the men who died. And I just want to point out one particular man. This man's name is uh, Charles McCullough. Anyone know him? Okay, so he's up, he's up in, um, he lives in the West End. But I, I just got something very unusual the other day, a couple, actually a couple of years ago. His if you know the Lobos up in Cedarwood, so Peter and Sally Lobo, I, I taught their kids, and I was scary. I taught their grandkids. And then, you know, I've known them for a lot of years. They're really good people. And I get something from Sally Lobo, and she said she got a letter, and it's from the Netherlands. And he died in a place called Margranton, Netherlands. Uh, he is buried there along with 10,023 American soldiers. And they were trying, they, somehow they got Sally Lobo's name. They sent a, a note to her and they said, We're trying to get a picture of everyone for 10,000 because every two years they, they do a ceremony in the Netherlands and they, they want to recognize the people. So they have a picture next to the gravestone uh, of, the, of the person. So she gave it. A mobile family sent some pictures and information of, uh, of it, it would have been Sally Lobo's um, uncle, her uncle. And the ambassador to the Netherlands is called Faces of Monography. And he said this He said, We can look into their faces, and we will all read something different into each face. We know that when we look into a face, we see a unique and special individual, someone with aspirations, someone with dreams, someone with hopes. So it's a good way that they were remembered. General MacArthur visits Waltham. So the war comes to an end. You look at Waltham City Hall. Welcome, General MacArthur. The Northwest School is renamed the MacArthur School. And the general is right here. Big crowd here. Yeah. Bring him after the war. And when I say when we get visitors, we give them a walk and watch. I don't know what we give them today. <laughs> this general has it. This man's name is Rocco Kalor. Uh, that's Sally Kalor's father. And he was in charge of uh, the Veterans Bureau. And his general pastor, the Murphy Hospital on uh, Forest Street, was where a lot of the veterans were sent for recuperating. General Mahatma and Mr. Kalor over there. And this to me is just a, such a powerful picture, a very haunting picture. And these were put up after the war, and it's all of the wealthy men and women who were involved in the war. It says, uh, Wealthy Water Roll, the water country, next to the street in the background. I think that would be so nice to have that today. Look, we, we have a small memorial to, to recognize the names. And to be go up and be able to point to people and say, that's my uncle, that's my great grandfather, look for your name and just say, I wonder if this person is related to me. But I just find that an incredibly moving picture. Okay, okay. now we're leaving Waltham, so that's the end of the presentation.